You know, a uh, Christian without a church is an orphan. And of course, we believe, you'd expect me to believe that uh, the church is very important in someone's spiritual life, but it's just not what I believe. The Lord tells us that he loves the church, he gave himself for the church, and we know that he expects all of us who are believers to be tied into a body of believers, his body, the church. And so, uh, as Joshua said, if you haven't uh, signed up for the new members class, but you've been around Bethany Church uh, a little while, or, or you're here this morning and you're looking for a church home, I hope you'll stay uh, and come back at about 1230 and to be part of our new members class. Even if you just want to know a little bit more about Bethany Church, it's okay. There's no pressure to join today, but uh, it's always a lot of fun, and I look forward to meeting a lot of you and getting to know a lot of you better. It's 1230 uh, today, right after our 1115 service. So I invite you just to open up your your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark chapter 8. And so here's the question I want to think about as we get to this point in the Gospel of Mark in our study. The question is just this, who is Jesus? Who is Jesus? Now, I'm looking over the congregation this morning. Most of you I, I recognize and know. And, uh, and I know you to be quite, uh, you know, bright and intelligent, even have some spiritual maturity about you. I imagine uh, most of us can answer that question, at least to some degree, that we have some idea who Jesus Christ is. It's not just something that we've heard about but have no idea what he's about. But let me tell you about this question. This question is an important question. Well, let's go back one minute. This question is an important question question. It is, why well, I, I could tell you it's not just an important question. I would consider it to be the most important question that you could ever contemplate and then answer. Now that next slide, because the answer to this question is so important. How you answer this question will determine where you spend eternity. And really, I don't know of another issue that's any more important than this issue of where we spend eternity. What happens to us after we die, and where will we spend all of eternity? There's nothing more important than that. And so we've reached a very pivotal point in the Gospel of Mark. It's the halfway point, you might say. There's 16 chapters, so we've reached halfway through it. And if you've been here uh, for, you know, back way into the spring, we, the sermons all the way through to this point, or maybe you just dropped in today and you're joining us right here, it's a great point to, to join in. Because really these first eight chapters that we've been looking at, well, the ministry of Jesus has been centered in that region called the Galilee. He's been in that northern part of Israel around the Sea of Galilee, and he has been really teaching the, the Jewish people He's been teaching crowds. He's been performing miracles and miracles and more powerful miracles. The miracles just just seem to be amping up. The crowds get bigger and bigger and bigger. And Jesus has just recently, as our study of the Gospel of Mark, has fed multitudes of people, literally out of nothing, just a couple of little sack lunches, where on one occasion maybe 20, 25,000, another occasion 10, 15, maybe more and that we see the healings that are taking place. It's been incredible what's taking place. But at this point forward, things take a dramatic shift. And you'll see it as we go through the rest of the Gospel of Mark, as you read it and as you look at it on Sunday mornings. Now we shift geographically to Jerusalem. And now the focus of Jesus is upon the cross. Jesus has moved from the crowds to where he is dealing with the disciples. And really now he's pouring himself into the life of the disciples. And so when you open up your Bibles to the Gospel of Mark, we, we left off really at around verse 21. And so in verse 22, which I'm not going to, to, to deal with in any detail today in this text, but I would encourage you to read it. In 22, Mark 8, 22 through 26, we have really, you might say, this last miracle of Jesus that takes place in the region of the Galilee. And um, and it's a significant miracle. I'm not passing over because it's not important. And I'm not passing over because it's not interesting. I just want to use it, though, to set up the context to dive into what we're going to look at today. 
In this miracle, Jesus heals a blind man. And that should never just be ho-hum to us, but Jesus has been healing blind people, lame people, deaf people. And so here is another blind man that Jesus heals. And so Jesus goes to this little fishing village right to the north of the, uh, the, north of the Sea of Galilee, the hometown of at least three of the, of the disciples who were fishermen, the Seda. And, and the people bring a blind man to Jesus. And Jesus takes the blind man aside and Jesus spits and takes the spittle and puts on his eyes and asks him, can he see anything? And, and the blind man responds, well, well yes, but not, not, all that, not all that good. You know, people look like trees. Now, this is kind of unusual because, you know, what did Jesus do? Did he kind of just miss it on the first go? Well, you know, I didn't, I didn't get really give that all my effort. I should have probably been concentrating a little more. That's not what's happening. But it says, Jesus then touched the man a second time. And then the man says, oh, I can see clearly. I can see, literally what it means is, I can see better than I've ever seen before. The implication being the man once had sight, lost his sight. His sight now was restored even better than it was. It's exactly how we would think Jesus would perform a miracle. And this is sort of an odd miracle when you think about it. Because it's like Jesus sort of misfired the first time. Let me ask you, do you think Jesus really messed up the first time? No, he did mess up the first time. Do you think he might have a purpose in what he's trying to teach his disciples and to teach us through this miraculous miracle message? Well, of course he does. Something he's teaching his disciples and something that I think he wants us to learn in this two-stage healing that leads to a two-stage confession. Now, kind of hold that in your mind for a moment. I don't know if you saw this in the news. It's kind of big news in the the circles of, you might say, in in the marketplace, in the church industry. But this past week, this year's, it comes out every two years, this year's, State of Theology survey was released. Now, you might have seen it if you kind of keep up with those things. It made some news in those circles. It was done in conjunction with Lifeway Research by Ligonier Ministries. Some of you are familiar with Ligonier Ministries. I know its founder, the late R.C. Spruill, once said, everybody is a theologian. Everybody is a theologian. But not everybody is a good theologian. And I thought, man, that's really good. And he's so right. Everybody is a theologian. Everybody has some types of thought about God, who he is, what he does, how he operates. Everybody's a theologian. But not everybody's a good theologian. Not everybody's a good theologian. And so when the state of theology, this survey came out, And I'm not going to bore you with all these details. It's always a little bit surprising and also a little bit disconcerting for all of us who are in ministry and teach as as pastors. But for example, probably the major finding there was when people were surveyed, U.S. and the United States adults, and asked about the Bible. And they were asked, do you agree with the statement The Bible is not literally true. The Bible is not literally true. You know, I'm not surprised that over half, 53% of adults in the U.S. agreed with that. They said, well, of course the Bible's not literally true. Matter of fact, I'm surprised it was just 53% of the adults that said that. Probably the surprising thing was that 26% Over a quarter, one of every four evangelical Christian agreed with that statement. Now, if you're wondering, well, who are evangelical Christians? I'll just save you the trouble. We are. We are. People who believe in the the Bible as God's word and Jesus Christ as God's son and his death on the cross, his resurrection, those primary points of of, of theology um, in in confession of faith, that he's de- he died, buried, raised, raised from the dead, and coming again. That's us. We're evangelical. So let's, let's just break it real simple. So one out of four of people like us 
said, I don't really believe the Bible is literally true in every aspect or it's God's word. Now, there's implications that come from that when you don't believe in God's word. And probably the most profound implications that result out of that is the wrong beliefs that people have about Jesus. After all, how do we know who Jesus really is? Why he really came, what he really did, and what will happen in the future? Well, that is revealed to us in God's word. And so what you have happening then are some things that are very disconcerting. For example, when asked, do you agree or disagree that Jesus is not the only way to God? In other words, there is more than one way to God and any way to God, as long as you believe it sincerely, could be as good as any other way to God. That Jesus isn't exclusive in his claims. That Jesus isn't the only way to God. 56% of evangelicals, us, agreed with that. Agreed with that. Or the statement, Jesus was created by God. That Jesus is a created being created by God. 73% of evangelicals believed that statement. Or third, Jesus is not God. He's not divine. He's not deity. He's not God. 43% of evangelicals believe that statement to be true. Now those, let me just say in the strongest terms, this is just rank heresy. And it has been heresy in the church from the first century to the 21st century. And the church has always been dealing with these perceptions of Jesus Christ that are false. Is he the only way to God? Was he created by God? He's not God? Well, we need to be able to answer those questions and know those questions and what we believe about the Bible influences us. Now, my guess is that some of you may, may or may not really, I'm not even going to guess what the percentage would be here, but it would probably be somewhat, probably even our own congregation, a little bit divided. That kind of leads us to this point right here in the Gospel of Mark chapter 8 and verse 27. It's a familiar story in the, in the life of Jesus Two years now, he's been with his disciples. Two years plus, he's been in this ministry publicly, calling his disciples, building to this point. And so we read in verse 27 that Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, who do people say that I am? So Jesus does a survey. Hey, guys. Hey, what, what's the word out there? Who do people say that I am? Well, they reply. And you can kind of imagine the guys walking along and, and they're just sort of, well, this is what folks are saying about you. Some say you're John the Baptist. Others say you're Elijah. Maybe even Jeremiah, we're told. Still others say one of the prophets. A little while, they go on. But Jesus then turns a little bit more pointed. But, but what about you? What about you, he asked. Who do you say that I am? And Peter answered, you are the Messiah. The word that's used there is Christos. You are the Christ in Greek, Messiah in Hebrew, the exact same word, the anointed one. And then Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Gave them this command to be silent. And then in verse 31... Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things, must be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed after three days and then will rise again. And he spoke plainly about this to them. And Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. 
But when Jesus turned and looked, you could imply it, at Peter and all his disciples, he rebuked Peter, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. You do not have the mind that concern, the con- have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. And so this is this great confession that Peter makes, followed up by the transpiring of not what's happening. This is a really a two-stage confession. And, and let me just go and tell you, can you kind of maybe get the, 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 the introduction of the miracle? They don't quite, well, they see, but they don't quite see focused yet. And so let me just kind of put something in context with you here. So here on this map, we've been looking at Jesus' ministry all around the Galilee. A couple of weeks ago, we talked. He took this big swing up through Gentile area. Last week, he came back over and had the miracle of the feed back in the Galilee, the feeding of the multitudes of four thousand. Here's Capernaum, his major base of operation. He comes to Bethsaida. This is where he heals the man in Mark. We just read in, in Mark twenty-two. Then Jesus takes his disciples. 25 miles north to Caesarea Philippi. Takes them up. He's still in, you might say, Israel, but now this is the northern point of Israel, the headwaters of the Jordan River, the foot of Mount Hermon, which also might be the Mount of Transfiguration. He takes them on a journey. So they're going up, and you can go there even today. So in this next slide, you see if you go there today, this is what you see. You see the ruins of Caesarea Philippi. It's in a beautiful, I think one of the most beautiful regions there in the northern part of of the Galilee. There's water there. And uh, also, but you begin to see the ruins. And you say, well, it doesn't look all that great to me. But you begin to see the the ruins. You can kind of imagine there at one time, one of the springs for the Jordan was flowing out of this cave right here. There's our niches right here that were for pagan gods that were there. And so in the days of Jesus, archaeologists believed it looked something like this. There was a temple there in front of that cave, and water was running out of it, almost like living water running out of it. It was also, this is a, this is a temple to Caesar at Caesarea. Philip, the son of Herod the Great, built these temples there to this region, renamed it, dedicated to Caesar, and tagged his name on it, Caesarea Philippi. There are temples to 14 other, 14 other temples and 14 other gods there. Baal, Pan, by the, and Pan, you know, the, the, that mythological god creature, half man, half animal, has a flute. This is for so, presumably the birthplace of Pan, and where Pan was worshipped here. This is the image. This is the background. Jesus is taking them here. It's as if Jesus is taking his disciples we got, we got one more thing to do before we leave the Galilee. We're going to do a final exam, and we're going to take a field trip. And on the back, for the background, the context of this exam, I want to have this image of the, of the mighty power of Caesar, who also claimed to be God and demanded worship, along with all these other gods and religions of this region and the world, that you can worship anything and everything. I want all of this as really the background for this question. Who am I? Who do people say that I am? Who do you think that I am? And then Jesus really clears it up. And so really three simple questions today as we work our way through this passage. Can I give us a little bit of outline? So here's question number one. Jesus asks them, who do people say that Jesus is? And we've already seen that, you know, people have a lot of opinions about Jesus even to this day. So it says, on the way. So you can kind of, you know, verse the next verse, on the way, he asked them, you know, who do people say that I am? You can imagine. So they're walking. And well, you know, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, uh, one of the prophets. But he, he wants them to grasp and, and to be thinking about two truths with this question. Who is he? Who is he? And what did he come to do? His person and his plan, his purpose. 
Now he's kind of bringing them in to be thinking about this. Who he is, why he came, what is his purpose in coming. So he takes them to Caesarea Philippi. Gives them this context of all these false gods to think about. Who, who, who am I? We know over here, with this background, visiting all these villages around Caesarea Philippi, you have to decide who I really am. Who I really am. Who he is versus what they are. That's the same thing every one of us has to determine. We have to come to some settlement to this question of who Jesus is. Who Jesus is. And so this is what the people are saying. Well, you're John the Baptist has been risen from the dead. You know, John the Baptist resurrected, been hanging around for a long time. Elijah, Matthew says, and he records this in that Jeremiah, uh, the prophets. But this is what I, I want you to see. People have always had many different ideas about who Jesus really is. They've always had different ideas since Jesus has been around who he really is. And so people will form their opinion about Jesus based on something. What have you based your opinion about Jesus upon? Whatever you believe about Jesus, why do you believe it? Now what's interesting to me is that people usually have very positive ideas about Jesus. Uh -huh. He's a good man. Did a lot of good things. Good teaching. You know, he's a good prophet. He, and all these positive things. Rarely do you hear anything that people just, oh, they just speak badly about Jesus. Oh, they'll speak badly about those who follow Jesus in his church. But Jesus, you know, Jesus is pretty good. We're okay with Jesus. But we're going to see positive ideas about Jesus aren't enough. Aren't enough. And so that sets up the second question. Now the second question is, well, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that Jesus is? So now it becomes personal for every one of us. So now I'm just going to talk to you. I'm not talking to anybody else in the room. I'm not talking to the person next to you. I'm just talking to you. Who do you think Jesus is? Who do you think he is and why do you believe it? And what are the consequences the implication and the results of why you believe it. Because here's, here's the moment of truth. You've got two years coming right up to this point. And, it, it, and it, just about eight months before this, in Mark chapter 4, these disciples are out on a boat in the middle of a storm. And Jesus, they wake him up. He calms the storm. And when the, and when the Sea of Galilee goes as smooth as glass in Mark 4.41, these guys are on that boat. They're dumbfounded. And they just look at one another and say, who is this guy? Who is this? And it's probably the question that's been turning in their minds for almost two years. Miracle after miracle, teaching after teaching, Two years ago, they were just plain, simple fishermen, farmers going about life. Jesus shows up. Who is this guy? And Jesus asks them now, here is the moment. Who do you say that I am? I don't know now how it kind of went. I can only imagine. But I think Peter, always the spokesman for the 12, just spoke out what they had already probably been talking about amongst themselves. Well, he says, well, you're the Messiah. You're the Messiah in verse 29. You are the Christ. It literally means the anointed one. Prophets, priests, and kings were the only ones anointed in the, in the Old Testament. You're the chosen one. You're the long-promised, awaited one. Four words. You are the Christos. You are the Messiah the Christ. Christ isn't his middle name. Christ isn't his last name. Christ is who he is. It's his title, the Messiah. And this, I, this has got to be Peter's finest moment. I, I know without a doubt this is Peter's 
greatest moment in a ministry that is potmarked with a lot of bad moments. Peter had a good game. Man, he, he really, you might say, just kind of rose up and played above himself. It let, this had been led, Jesus had been leading them to this confession and commitment. And this is the first recorded human confession declaring Jesus to be the Messiah, the Christos. God had declared it. Demons had declared it. First human recorded declaration, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the long-awaited one chosen by God, Savior of the people. Now, in Luke chapter 9, Mark chapter, and Matthew chapter 16, this incident is also recorded. Matthew gives us even probably the better known and a fuller explanation of what happens there. So in Matthew 16, 16, we read, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah. And then added on that, you are the son of the living God. That's basically a declaration of deity. You are God himself. You are the son of God. You are the Christos. And Jesus replied, Simon, Simon, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood. He said, you didn't come up with this on your own. You didn't make this up. The Father has revealed it to you from heaven by his spirit. Then he gives this great, in verse 18, declaration. I'm going to tell you something, Peter. Upon this rock, upon this declaration that you just made about who I am, I will build my church. Now, this is so important. The church of Jesus Christ is built upon the confession and the truth of who Jesus is. He is the Christ. And everything we hold and build our faith upon is built upon that foundational truth, that rock. He is the Christ. He is the Christ. And Mark, and just kind of, Mark doesn't really record that for us. And I, I don't know why Mark doesn't record this exchange that Jesus has. It's inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And again, I think that Peter is the source of Mark's gospel. I think Peter may have just maybe just bowed, showed a little humility in that regard to Mark. And it wasn't concluded. But it's on this confession that the church is built upon. And that's important to know. The church of Jesus Christ is built upon who he is and what he's come to do. And if you do not know that, and if we do not know that, and if we get away from that, everything crumbles. Everything falls apart. And you can begin to see, just from that little survey I shared with you at the beginning, things are crumbling. You begin to see that people are a little shaky on this. And I can wring my hands and just and, and be distraught about that. And I am. But what keeps me up at night and what I worry about is what you think about it. Because I'm responsible for you. And so I'm going to tell you exactly what the truth is. Not revealed to I didn't. I'm not making it up. It's revealed to us in God's word, which we believe to be literally true in God's word. And this is what he tells us about himself and who Jesus Christ is and what he's come to do. So this is what is important. You must know and confess who Jesus really is. You must know and confess who he really is. And so, here's the next question to build our outline. What, what does Jesus, who does Jesus say that he is? Who does he say that he is? And so we read in verse 31, Jesus began to teach them that he's the son of man, I'm the, I'm, which is another title as, as, the, as the Messiah and the favorite designation of Jesus for himself. I'm, I'm God's son. I'm the son of man. I'm fully God, fully man. Must. And this is a word that means necessary under compulsion. This, is, this has to happen. I must suffer many things. I must be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. I must be killed, and after three days, I must rise again. Now, he's, he's explaining that as simply as he can. He tells us, I know exactly who I am. I know exactly why I came. And only fully understanding this 
Can we understand who Jesus is? I must suffer, I must be rejected, I must be killed, and I must rise again after three days. These are the like four musts of Christianity. And this is all part of God's preordained plans from the beginning, even before. It's always been this way. And it says in verse 32, he spoke plainly to them. Now, before he'd been teaching in parables, we're told. He's not speaking in parables. He's not saying, what do you, he is telling them over, and it means he spoke plainly, means it really continually. He's telling them over and over and over again. This is what is going to happen. And I don't know how long this went on, but it went on for a period, I think, of, of maybe a few days, a little bit of time for sure. And then Peter Probably, I don't know, maybe at the urging of the, of, the, of the other 11, but no doubt the leader of the 12 takes it upon himself. They've kind of had enough. He sort of puts his, maybe just puts his arm around Jesus' shoulder, kind of takes him to the side. And he begins to rebuke him. That's a strong word. He, it's not mild. He speaks boldly to Jesus. What's wrong with you? This is, not what we're, this is not what we've been taught and believe about the Messiah. There's no Messiah that comes from heaven that's going to suffer, that's going to be delivered over, rejected, that's going to be, well, it's going to be killed. No, there's no way. You've got that part wrong. Quit saying it. Quit saying those things. Jesus has been plainly telling him what he is, who he is, what's going to happen. Peter wants nothing of it. And in the, in the, in the tent, he, Jesus is trying to impress them. And the word for rebuke means strong condemnation. And the more I think about it, this is Peter's worst moment. I think it is worse than when he denied him three times. He takes Jesus face to face and just tells him, you're wrong. This is not what's going to happen. This is not what we want to happen. This is not what we expect to happen. This, you're wrong. Stop saying these things. It's like, you know, just a little, you can go from your greatest moment to your worst moment in just a matter of moments it, 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 it's, like, it's like, here's a little analogy for golfers. He, like he just made a hole in one. Like it doesn't get better for a golfer in hole in one. Gets right up to the next hole in quadruple bogeys. I mean, he just, he, he just, he, he talks to Jesus that way. In verse 33, it says, Jesus turned, looked at his disciples, because they all are thinking the same thing, rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. Is he calling Peter Satan? He's at least indicating, Peter, you're giving voice to the words of Satan. Get behind me, Satan. He recognizes the spirit of Satan is using Peter to make this lie prominent. You do not have in mind the concerns of God in human concerns. I mean, those are harsh words. Get behind me, Satan. Peter unloads on him, and you're just going to have to stop saying this, Jesus. You are dead wrong. Peter got it right when he called him to Christ. He gets it wrong when he tried to. This is what happens. Peter wants a Savior, a Messiah, without a cross. He does not want a cross and resurrection, and the pushback is strong. And you know why Peter doesn't want a cross and resurrection? Because Satan does not want a cross and resurrection. And Jesus does not push back. And why, this is what happened. Peter could see kind of fuzzy that Jesus was the Messiah. What he could not see clearly was what kind of Messiah he was going to be. And so the miracle sets up the message. He knew the identity of Jesus. He did not know the purpose of Jesus. You know what he didn't know? 
He did not know the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, who came to give his life for us. You know, I wonder, you know, it sounds like Jesus kind of overreacted a little bit. And Jesus didn't overreact. Jesus knew exactly how important this was. He, is, he, he knows that Satan is trying to set all of this up where avoiding the cross is nothing but demonic. It's nothing but demonic. That God has a plan for eternity. Christianity makes absolutely no sense or makes any difference without a cross. Now, you've got to write that down, and you should know that. Christianity makes no sense and makes no difference without the cross. It's been God's plan from all eternity. It's the only way for our sins to be forgiven. And Peter understood that Jesus was the Messiah. He just was expecting a powerful political Messiah that would overthrow Roman oppression. He was not looking for a suffering servant. Messiah and he really wanted no part of that and so let me just close with this who do you say that he is what do you believe about Jesus this is sort of what I would just end with here I think this is in one way you know you can kind of bang on Peter a little bit here and I just love Peter I've just grown even over this several months of preaching through Mark and Peter, I just grown to appreciate Peter even more. I think Peter's confession is so remarkable. It's revealed to him. You just have to remember, two years before this, Peter was just a common, ordinary Galilean fisherman. Fishing every day, selling his fish every day, getting up and doing the same the next day. He is chosen by God himself. He is in the process now of been, been learning from the rabbi Jesus for two years. Watching all of this, listening to all of this. And he would be spending the rest of his life telling others about this. And there are only two kinds of people in the world. Only two kinds of people in the world. Those who make the confession of Jesus Christ that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Or those who don't and don't believe him. Oh, he's a good man, a good prophet. I kind of like some of the stuff he teaches. Because what you determine by that determines whether or not you spend eternity with him with your sins forgiven or separate away from him with your sins unforgiven. Who is Jesus and what do you believe about him? Let's pray. And I don't know where you are, but what kind of person you are, but I hope you don't leave today without being a person who makes the confession, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and placing your trust and faith in him, and the one who died on the cross and was raised from the dead and is coming again. And if you don't know him, I want to tell you about him this morning. I'm going to be right here at the front. And for those of us who claim him and who do know him, I pray you'll draw closer to him through this, and you'll tell others about this good news of the gospel. And don't be fuzzy about who Jesus Christ is. There is a lost world that has no real understanding and concept of who Jesus Christ really is. And so don't be ashamed, don't be embarrassed, and don't be timid to tell them the truth. And where you get this truth is from God's Word. And it's all by faith in believing it. And I trust you believe in Him today. And so, Father, I pray you'll move among us today. I pray you'll touch our lives, you'll impact our lives by the most powerful thing there is. That's the good news of the gospel, of who Jesus is and why he has come and what he's done for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.